All right, everyone. Um, now we're going to investigate what we've called the public underground. Um, it's a way to start to introduce the human species to our subterranean lives here in Southern California. And to moderate this session, I've got Jeff Mana up here. Um, Jeff's uh, a colleague now at USC, um, a noted writer, essayist on exceedingly interesting topics. Please take a look at the bio in the program. And with uh, warm thanks to Jeff and to our panelists, I'll turn it over to you. Please join me in welcoming Jeff and this panel. Uh, cool. Thanks, Bill, and thanks, David, for putting together a great event and for uh, letting me be a part of it as well. Um, I just thought I'd say a really quick um, introduction. Um, my, uh, my own interest in the underground um, is, is uh, something that I've been obsessed with pretty much my entire life. Uh, you know, growing up all over the Midwest with, in a family that moved a lot, um, we were always going to check out caves that, you know, from the, the point of view of a, a young kid such as myself, you know, when you walk down the stairs into what appears to be the basement beneath someone's house and it turns out it's a show cave, um, it was always a pretty magical experience for me. Um, but I wanted to just give a very, very brief thumbnail sketch of the most um, recent sort of, uh, I guess, underground um, intersection that I've had recently because that was here in Los Angeles. Um, it's a story that many of my friends will roll their eyes at because I, I talk about it too much, but um, there was a great, uh, I wrote a book about burglary and architecture and in the midst of it I met the FBI agent who was in charge of investigating a still unsolved bank heist from 1986 here in Los Angeles, um, which actually took place uh, beneath uh, the Sunset Strip, beneath Sunset Boulevard. And uh, it was actually a, a group of individuals who used Suzuki four-wheelers and an incredibly granular uh, understanding of the city's stormwater network uh, to tunnel into a bank vault from below. Um, they got away with it. Uh, they've never been solved. In fact, it's beyond the statute of limitations, so they could, they could be here today <laughs> and, uh, and would not be arrested for it. Um, but uh, it was, it was what, I, what I thought um, was particularly interesting was that one of the uh, primary theories from the FBI at the time was that the people knew the storm sewer network so well that uh, they might have been disgruntled uh, water and power employees <laughs> who had decided to put their knowledge of the city to more lucrative use. Um, but so with a representative of uh, LA County Public Works on the panel, uh, perhaps uh, we, can, we can find out more about, maybe not that mystery, but at least the, uh, the, uh, the allure of the underground. Um, so, so I've got, I've got a great panel um, here, and, uh, and I'm really excited to be uh, able to, to moderate it. Um, you know, we, we're referring to it as the public underground. I think that you know some of these, the conversation might reveal a kind of um, ironic use of the word public. Many of these places are, are not particularly accessible or being um, locked off in a, uh, for the uh, private use, or at the very least uh, against trespassing. So perhaps that will come up in the in the in the questions. Um, and we will be treating this more as an informal Q&A, so rather than standalone presentations, we'll just be doing, um, I'd, I'd figure maybe 45 minutes or so of questions, and then um, we'll throw it open to the audience. So if you do have something that you want to ask the panelists, um, by all means, please do so. Uh, just hold on to it at the end, and, and I'll call on you. Um, so I'll just introduce everybody briefly before I, I sit down as well. Um, the closest to me is Dan Sharp. Um, he's a civil senior engineer with the LA County uh, Department of Public Works. Uh, it's a position he's had for nearly 20 years, so this is quite a lot of experience uh, with the uh, underground Los Angeles uh, here on the panel, and I'm looking forward to, to learning more. Um, next to him is Mike Manville. Uh, Mike is at UCLA, where he's in the urban planning department. Uh, he focuses on transportation and land use, uh, including uh, questions of public finance, and as we'll discuss today, specifically how that engages with parking. Um, how does parking help shape the surface of Los Angeles, but more interestingly, how does it shape the underground of Los Angeles? Um, and uh, uh, we'll be uh, uh, speaking about that with, with Mike. Um, and then finally, uh, last but not least, um, is D uh, USC's own David Sloan. Um, he's here in the, in the uh, public policy department. Um, he uh, has a wide range of, of, of um, interesting and intersecting uh, topics uh, that he's been writing about, including history, public health, crime, and burial. Uh, he's got a forthcoming book uh, with a great title called Is the Cemetery Dead? <laughs> and uh, with him, we'll be looking at um, what the, what it is, what it means to bury, um, how burial uh, has become part of the, Lo the Los Angeles landscape, and uh, adding that kind of uh, theme of um, ritualistic or symbolic interment. Um, so with that, I'm going to move three feet to my right and uh, continue to continue things from there. All right, is this is this on? Yep. Um, so my first question um, in in trying to get at the human. Uh, subsurface here in Los Angeles. Um, I actually want to start with, uh, with you, Dan. Um, you know, we, we spoke uh, before the event uh, about your work and about um, some of the things that you've um, seen and worked on here in LA. 
Um, but I think that many people just simply don't understand the scale of the underground. And I'm curious if you could just address uh, that basic question, the fact that there is an entire universe of, of uh, drainage culverts and that kind of thing underneath the surface of LA that very few people experience. So thank you. Yeah, my, um, my work, I am employed by the LA County Department of Public Works. The department operates the Los Angeles County Flood Control District. And so you might hear some of those names thrown out re with regard to the LA River and other, uh, um, other facilities like that. The, um, my work is mainly in drainage planning, looking at the um, long-term needs um, of dealing with, uh, with drainage infrastructure within the county, um, mainly looking at the rivers, but the, uh, the flood control system extends well beyond that. Um, if you guys are familiar with Biona Creek, um, it's uh, located in West LA. The, I think the creek itself is around 12 miles long, but at the upstream end, which is right here near Cochrane, um, between Fairfax and La Brea, right near Venice, these four um, culverts here, three of them you could drive a semi-truck into. That last one on the right is a little bit smaller than that. But um, this system extends almost seven miles up to um, very near uh, Silver Lake. And the drain up there at Silver Lake is just over two feet in diameter. So it starts as a small pipe up there, and it eventually um, comes into almost a freeway size, uh, at least one side of a freeway. Anyway, um, down, in, uh, down in West LA. If we can get, get the next slide. Um, this is a, a view up, up into that system. Those conduits are, like I said, extremely, lar extremely large. We can go ahead to the next one. Um, as the system continues upstream, there's, of course, smaller drains that interconnect. Um, yeah, I, if you get lost, just keep going downstream. You'll eventually get somewhere. <laughs> go ahead to the next slide. Um, yeah, you can see the uh, different kinds of materials that are used. Uh, this is a reinforced concrete pipe. Those are usually built off-site, transported by truck, and then lowered in by crane into a trench in the construction of the drains. Um, the previous slide showed the uh, reinforced concrete box. That's usually cut, built, and then covered, uh, poured in place, and then covered back up. Go ahead and hit the next one. Um, this shows the, ex you know, the, the distance that it goes from all the way um, like I said, there in West LA, up to Silver Lake, and there is a extensive network of drains. You can go ahead to the next slide, which shows <laughs> that these uh, these drains are everywhere underneath us. And if anyone is interested, you can uh, Google search LA County Storm Drain Viewer. And I and I, I I don't think my Google is so skewed that you won't get the same result, but um, that. That will allow you to, um, it's an it's a, um, online viewer that will allow you to see where the drains are, how big they are, um, but yeah, don't go in them. <laughs> All right, we can, uh, do you want, I can just finish up with a couple more? Yeah, if we go to the next one. Um, this is a, gives you an idea of the size of the underground facilities that we have. This is a uh, four bay for a pump station. So it's in a, it's in a uh, relatively low area. There's about 300 acres that drains to this site. Um, it's down in Torrance. This uh, facility is over 20 feet high um, and over 100 feet in each direction. Um, and that allows the, this low area, the, drain, or the water drains to it. It fills up the, that pump. Uh, as the pumps are pumping, the water gets higher and higher in this four bay and then is pumped out to a uh, downstream drain. Hit the next slide. And then, oh, that was it. So um, that just gives you an idea of the, of the extents. And we also have, um, similar to that, to that pump station four bay, we have some of those facilities underground that allow water to seep into the underground aquifers as well. So those are underneath parks and in different parts of the, different parts of the city. Um, and I believe you mentioned as well that the, there's 3,600 miles roughly of, of drains, which is enough to reach Alaska yeah. end to end, yeah, which yeah. is inc pretty incredible. They're, they're everywhere, it's great. Yeah. Um, well, I want to come back to the question of, um, of, uh, of basically why we have gone so uh, I I intensely underground with stormwater infrastructure in Los Angeles, um, but uh, I'll come back to that. Um, Mike, actually, in, in, in terms of um, your work with underground parking lots, um, I think that uh, it's, you, you've, you've explored a really interesting, um, I guess, the reasoning behind why we have underground parking lots in Los Angeles to the extent that we do. And I'm curious if you could address some of the zoning, legislative, and even financial pressures 
that push parking lots underground. So why is, are, are, are there so many underground parking lots in the city of LA? Sure. Is this? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, well, so part of the reason we have a lot of just underground parking lots is just that we have we have a lot of parking, um, that and and the uh, um, and because I, I think and I think that so there's there's two reasons why LA in general has a lot of parking and one is just that if you're going to have a city with a lot of cars you have to have mm -hmm. a lot of places to put them and that sounds obvious but it's actually the fundamental difference between sort of a city organized around automobiles and another city right like all transportation systems have. Uh, the three basic components to them. They have like the vehicles, the rights of way, and then what we call the terminals, which are just like the places where the vehicles sit when they're not moving. And so for like trains, you have your trains and your tracks and your stations and uh, it, you know, air travel has airplanes and, and flight routes and airports. And one of the things that sets cars apart, which in fact makes them so convenient, is that unlike with a train or an airplane, you aren't hostage to uh, you know, your travel plans aren't hostage to when and where other people are going, right? I can only fly someplace if a bunch of other people want to fly there, and, and, and I can only go when they're going. Um, the nice thing about owning a car is that I can go wherever I want, whenever I want. But conditioned on that, right, is the idea that when I get there, I have a place to put the car, right? And so when you organize a landscape around cars, it means that you just have to devote somehow a lot of space to storing them. And so that's why, you know, in the U.S. right now, the estimate is there's probably four at least parking spaces for every car, right? Because the car wouldn't work unless it had a lot of parking spaces arrayed around it somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and the, but the second reason L.A. has a lot of parking, and the bigger reason that's probably more problematic, is that we, we force developers to build it. That every time, in our zoning code, every time someone builds housing or retail space or something, they, the city uh, applies what's called a minimum parking requirement and says, well, if you're going to build an apartment, every apartment has to have a parking space, or 1.25 parking spaces, actually, in most of LA. If you're going to build a condo, every condo unit needs to have 2.25 parking spaces. And this seems reasonable, and it actually probably made some sense um, back when LA was a, a much more suburban place. But as you start to get more urban, and as, as, as many of the, the city's goals become to make Los Angeles a more urban-oriented <coughs> Uh, spot and, and, and development gets denser, the parking, there's no room for surface parking anymore in many parts of our city, and so the parking has to go underground, right? And so that becomes extremely expensive. Uh, underground parking usually costs about $50,000 a space. Uh, sometimes it's as high as $60,000 a space because the excavation is so expensive, particularly when you're excavating like infill development and it's next to existing buildings and so forth. And so what that does is two things. One is that it just makes it harder to build. So like our ability to make a sort of dense urban landscape is constrained by the fact that our developers have to spend money that in another place, like New York or Boston, they could use to build up. They first have to dig down. But the more sort of pervasive thing it does um, is that it lowers the price of driving, right? That, that the easier it is to store a car, the easier it is to drive a car. And so when every destination in a city has parking right at it, the, the chances that you will drive to it go up. And, and so one of the, you know, so what we've done, if you go back to what I talked about, these three components of a transportation system, is you've taken the terminal cost of driving, like what the driver should pay at the end of the trip, and you've pulled it away from the drivers and dumped it on the developers. Um, and you don't have to like developers and feel bad for them to realize that that actually turns into a pretty big subsidy for driving. And so one result of it is that even in the spaces that we want to have be very urban, um, because every building has parking beneath it, and sometimes lots and lots of parking, if you look at Disney Hall, six lay of levels of parking beneath it, um, you don't get an urban environment. You don't get this situation where people are walking around and on the street because every building becomes its own sort of atomized destination that you drive to and then you go up into and then you drive away from and you never actually have like the level of street life we might have in a comparable place. So that's it kind of in a nutshell. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot there that I want to come back to including um, Disney Hall. Um, but um, just David, uh, just to, to get you into the conversation, um, you've written some really interesting uh, studies of uh, not just burial and cemeteries in, in Los Angeles, but all over the country. Um, and in fact, you've focused um, uh, pretty interestingly on the symbolic 
nature of two cemeteries here in LA, Hollywood Forever and, and Forest Lawn. Um, I'm curious if you could just address uh, what is it about those two cemeteries and the way in which burial, or for that matter, the way in which memorials are practiced there, um, how they differ, and uh, what that says about burial in the city of LA? Sure. Uh, this is on, right? It's a little harder to hear when you're talking. Um, so cemeteries are really fascinating places for lots of different reasons. Uh, they represent a uh, cultural space that we uh, construct. Uh, they represent a natural space that we construct. They have in them the remains of communities for long periods of time, hundreds of years, in some cases, uh, literally uh, millennia. And so they represent all sorts of possible ways to think about a city. Right? So when you look at the difference between a Père Lachaise in Paris and how that represents a certain time in Paris versus the Cemetery of Innocence that it replaced that represented an earlier time or the, the underground uh, crypts, etc., you can go through. And so the great thing about Los Angeles is that it has representatives, two representatives, uh, actually more than two representatives, of uh, these sort of moments in time. So you could go back to the Mission Cemeteries and think about how we buried then. You could go move up until the latter part of the 19th century and early part of the 20th century and look at Forest Lawn. And then you can come till today and think about how do we use cemeteries today. So it's both how people are buried and how we actually mourn them or how we memorialize them that each of these would represent differently. So in some sense, if you're in the mission or if you're at that beautiful slide of the Protestant cemetery, um, basically what's going to happen, you're going to be wrapped in a shroud, put in a uh, pine box, put in the ground. The thing's going to collapse on top of you at some point because of the water that's in the ground, and that you're going to decay, right? At, at Forest Lawn, by the latter part of the 19th century, and when Forest Lawn becomes a memorial park in the second decade of the 20th century, you're going to be like a little Russian doll, right? You're going to go into a hardwood casket. You're going to put inside a steel vault or a concrete vault. That's going to get the casket's going to get covered up by the vault. That's going to get covered up. Then you're going to be covered with dirt. Then you're going to have lawn on top of that. Then you're going to have a little mon marker, a flush marker. Uh, you saw one of those in the slide deck as well. And so it's a very different way to think about dying today. In Los Angeles, somewhere between 50 and 60% of all dispositions, and it's probably actually moving towards 70%, are, are actually in Los Angeles, probably still in the 50, 60% are going to be cremations. And so you're not going to be put in a, a casket. You're not going to be put in a vault. You're not going to be put in the ground in the same way. You could actually be just scattered, which is a growing trend. Or you could be put in little niches, or you could be buried in a little plastic container or a little other more innate container on top of one of those old vaults. And so the actual type of burial actually changes over time. What I'm particularly interested in is how we use these landscapes, these, these places of disposition to assert values, symbolic values. And so in the Mission Cemetery or the Protestant Cemetery, you saw that beautiful arched very simple upright marker that was to an individual. And then uh, in the cemetery I grew up in, in Syracuse, New York, most of the main monuments would have been family monuments. They would be bigger angels, all the sort of classic things that you see on Halloween. And then in Forest Lawn, Forest Lawn's uh, the creator, Hubert Eaton, says, that stuff's too expensive, it's too ghoulish, it reminds me of death, I don't want to be thinking about the dead people, I want to just create a memorial park. And so it's Forest Lawn Memorial Park, not Forest Lawn Cemetery, which is how it was founded in 1906. And so he changes that. He lowers almost all the graves to flush to the ground. You know, you only get a little bronze marker or a little marble marker. And then he places into those sections these large institutional sculptures that represent the values of home, family, church, and state. So patriotism, Christianity, family, and home. And these are all, the, if you go to Forest Lawn or you go to most memorial parks, they're all, you can see the names of the, of, the, of the sections are tied to these institutional. 
Then you come to a, a Hollywood Forever is a really interesting example because Hollywood Forever was one of those sort of medium cemeteries in between the Mission and the Memorial Park. So it really was a sort of classic latter uh, 19th, early 20th century cemetery with uprights, monuments, families, stones, community mausoleum, sort of straightforward. But you know, the model doesn't really work very well anymore. Because if you have 60% of the people being cremated, there's not a lot of people left to be buried in a cemetery. So you have to start thinking about how do you create a new symbolic landscape that actually is participatory and public. And so what you do is you get this crazy guy who runs Cinespia to put a movie on the side of a very large community mausoleum. Or my favorite thing, and if you've never done this, you just missed it, it's just over, but if you've never done it, next year, you gotta do it early because it sells out, go to their Day of the Dead celebration. <laughs> They have about 30,000 people. They have three or four bandstands, one of them inside the mausoleum. All, all typically traditional uh, music from Mexico. So it's not you know little rock and roll bands from LA even. It's really, they bring bands. Each stage has its little region of Mexico that it represents. And then you, there's like somewhere between 20 and 50 shrines. The very elaborate shrines that people have. Has anybody gone? So you know, the very elaborate shrines that people make. What this represents is in some sense a very different model than Forest Lawn, where they were the, you know, there is reasonable proof that Forest Lawn was the second most visited place by tourists in Los Angeles prior to Disneyland. So they, they actually did it institutionally, and if, has anybody ever been to the Forest Lawn show? where they do the, the uh, uh, crucifixion and resurrection. Uh, just a couple. Used to be very popular. And so they have this huge uh, uh, painting that they actually used, again, to push forward. Remember, Forest Lawn, found in 1917, is a white Christian place. Nobody but a Caucasian can be buried there. And, and they really focus on trying to pound you with the idea of Christianity and family. And so it, the cemetery thus represents this underground world, right? This underground world and how it shifts and the symbolic language that is above the ground. Um, the, the appeal of that underworld, I think, is, is, a, is something that really interests me and even goes back to something that David Ulin mentioned in his question in the previous panel, which is that, that, that sort of the fine line between, I guess you could say, the, the real world and, and myth. Um, but I guess I'm interested um, in talking about that briefly, about the, the attraction of the, of the underworld. Um, Dan, when you and I spoke before the event, um, you mentioned, and, and perhaps didn't mean to mention, that um, you know, as, a, as a youth, you, you uh, used to explore tunnels and that kind of thing, um, to actually go down into the sewers that you now are more or less in charge of you know, designing or, or, or supervising. Um, but I guess I'm just curious if you could talk about uh, the different motivations or um, attraction of that kind of thing. I mean, today one could argue that kids might go into the sewers because they want to take a particularly evocative Instagram. But in an era when you were growing up before Instagram, what was the attraction? You know, what was it that brought you into sewers as a kid? And is it the yeah. same thing that brought you to the, this field of work today as an adult? Sure. So um, yeah, it's interesting. You know, you want to go down and it's it's somewhere that you know other people aren't, and you want to go and check it out. Um, I've since found that. Um, well, okay, so. I'm, I'm not trying to pick on you, but it's uh, they're storm drains. It's different, different, and so I'm just the um, storm drain network is distinctly separate from the from the sewers, and you can tell by the smell when um, <laughs> when you go um, when you go into the the normal the, the storm drain system that accepts runoff uh, from the curbs and gutters. Um, there is some kind of you know there's a mustiness and kind of a funk to it, but it's nothing like having toured Hyperion. Uh, sewage treatment plant, ooh, yeah, very different smells. But um, anyway, sorry to pick on you. But um, the, uh, yeah, the, as far as the, the interest in trying to go into something and get somewhere where, uh, where other people haven't been is, uh, and not that nobody's gone in there, but it's like, you know, it's not normal. You want to go and explore. That's always fun. Um, I did that when I was in junior high, living in San Diego. Um, we went and found some cool stuff popped a manhole and went to 7-Eleven and got some candy and then went back down. 
avoided the cops. That was good, mostly. Um, we did avoid the rain. That the one of the days that I was doing it, and it was the last time I went in because you know I kind of learn sometimes. Um, after we'd come out, we were hanging at my friend's house, and it started started raining like really hard, and we ran outside to go look at the open um, drain where we were able to get in, and it was filled two thirds with water, and so the ability or the purpose of these is to is to drain surface <laughs> runoff and to take it somewhere and to do that in a in a safe manner and for us to have been screwing around in there was um probably a bad idea um and you know what what i've learned since uh working for the department of public works is just the the safety involved with uh going into confined spaces and the gases that can build up and the how that can very quickly overwhelm anyone um, and there's not a lot of good ways to get out of them. So that being said, you know, I don't know. Sorry to be a downer, but yeah. Don't, don't try don't, this at home. Don't, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's funny. There's there are stories from the urban exploration community of, um, yeah, people getting everything from, uh, you know, r running out of oxygen and having to get out of a drain extremely quickly to avoid fainting, but even, um, I can't remember the exact name, but there was a, I, I want to call it, um, almost like rickets flu or that kind of thing, but it wasn't the, the actual disease, but it was named after a, a hydrological engineer in Minneapolis because a lot of kids that were going into the, I don't know if it was sewers or storm drains to be completely honest, but um, we're coming out with a, you know, interesting lung conditions uh, that seem to be endemic to, to those uh, subterranean environments. So yeah. there's yeah, different, different gases and uh, mm -hmm. other, other things. Anything from the street can end up in there. So if there's a, you know, hazardous waste spill, that's one thing that, uh, that our, our crews deal with, we'll you know chase that that spill downstream and try to capture it before it gets out into the into the river. So that's a uh, one one risk. Um, another thing that's interesting, uh, we were talking about the La Brea tar pits, and there are natural seeps in our storm drains that we cannot, for the life of us. We, I mean, we're doing our best, but we cannot close those up, and so there's natural seeps of uh, some tar into the storm drain system. So, don't know what other other stuff comes with that. Yeah, it's the, the return of the repressed. Yeah. Um, uh, Mike, Zombie you diatoms. Yeah, yeah. Mike, you mentioned um, Disney Hall. Uh, I'm curious if um, either to go into, into more depth, so to speak, to use a bad pun, with Disney Hall and its, and its parking structure um, or other facilities around Los Angeles. Um, what's a place that really exemplifies or um, is a, almost like a tourist destination that you might take somebody if you were leading a tour of underground parking lots? What really kind of sums up... <laughs> Uh, or, or would illustrate well the uh, particular nature of underground parking in the city of LA, something on the Wilshire Corridor, for example? Yeah, I mean, Disney Halls is, is a good one. I mean, there's a particular story uh, behind it that, that I'll tell in a moment. But I, I think the main, I'm not sure, it's never occurred to me to lead people on a tour of underground parking. I'm not sure that anyone would take me up on that. I'd do it. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. Well, right after the talk. No. Um, the, I, I think that. What people don't understand, I guess, when they when they and Disney Hall becomes a good example of this. But you mentioned the the tall buildings on the Wilshire Corridor as well. If you lots of places in downtown Los Angeles, like the Arco Towers or things like that, is that if you were to look at these places from the air and not know they were L.A., they don't look that much different than a lot of other cities. And you would say, well, this is a fairly urban environment, and oh, I could just imagine that this is a place where people walk a lot. Or Century City is another great one. Because what you can't see is that underneath every building is multiple stories of parking. Um, and that that's what actually damages the street life. And so Disney Hall is a great example because it was this, this sort of gem uh, architecturally. And it was also supposed to be the beginning of the revitalization of Grand Avenue to bring it back to a more urban environment. But when the decision was made, implicitly or explicitly, that like most of the people who are going to enter Disney Hall uh, are going to come up through the bottom on this escalator cascade. I mean, if you go to Disney Hall, lots of people go, but uh, relatively few go through the front door. Um, and and the, the story behind that is that, of course, the it's a concert hall. Concert halls have certain parking requirements under our zoning, and so you had to build this giant underground parking structure to legally be able to build the concert hall. And so the county actually owns that land and and... Yeah, right, and built the parking structure. And actually, it built the parking structure. It's some incredible amount of money that is now not coming into my brain. Um, and, but did it uh, while it was also going broke. Like, the county was having a tough time in the 90s. And so it, was, it, it went into huge debt to build this parking structure. And then, of course, Disney Hall was delayed badly. 
and so when it was finally finished, uh, the the county sort of it signed a lease with the county to to use the parking structure, and the county built into the lease a minimum number of concerts that the hall had to have so that the county could pay down the debt on the parking structure. And so the, the minimum parking requirement became the minimum concert requirement. And I mean, that's just sort of an interesting fiscal twist, but I think if you contrast what's become of Grand Avenue, right, with these, these buildings that we've, we've subsidized uh, to a great extent, um, and, and they're, they're bright, they're new, and they're shiny, and their architects designed them, uh, and, and it really hasn't generated a very urban environment. It's generated tall buildings, but like it's, you know, you, the street is usually pretty empty. And then just go down the hill and look at the, the revitalization of the historic district. Um, and one reason why those buildings sat empty for so long is because they had no parking, right? And so it was illegal to turn them into housing. And then we took our zoning and said, well, actually, you know, those, these buildings are exempt. That's what the adaptive reuse ordinance did. It exempted them from having to build parking. Not only did they get converted into housing, but because you had a lot of people living in an area where it was hard to drive, it became an urban area. And like, so the big difference between a New York and an LA or a San Francisco and an LA and a Boston and an LA, people say, well, so they have the subway system. Subways are great, right? But the real difference with New York and LA is how expensive it is to own a car. And it's so expensive to own a car, not because cars are expensive to buy in New York, because you have to, it's storing them costs a fortune. And so if you can't, like Lewis Mumford, way back in the 60s, wrote in uh, one of his essays, he said that the, the right to access every building in a city by private car is actually the right to destroy the city. And because that, what it does is it just untangles like the, the sort of intricate quilt of interactions that, that constitute urbanism. Everything just becomes its own destination. And Disney Hall is a great example of how we haven't learned that lesson. Um, there was a really interesting event. Maybe, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, my, my, my scariest one was an Arco Tower. I got caught in there, and you can't get out. That's right. Yeah. I thought I was going to be there for the rest of my life, because the only, other, only way out is across that thing that comes right. down off the freeway. And I had like six students with me, and I was saying, OK, so you know, maybe you're going to die, but we're going to make it. <laughs> the, the, the new J.G. Ballard novel. Um, there, there was an event maybe a year and a half ago that um, Christopher Hawthorne, the LA Times architecture critic, hosted up at Occidental um, that, that just had an interesting anecdote. Um, he, he did an email interview with Mike Davis, the, the caustic LA culture writer. And um, Mike had this great uh, kind of pseudo conspiracy theory about, about, about parking in Los Angeles. But, you know, his, his notion was that, you know, if you want to know why there isn't a subway that goes to LAX, look at the parking industry, look at the lobbyists, look at who's funding the surface uh, expression of Los Angeles. Um, you know, if you want to know why certain things about, you know, subway placement, et cetera, even, even these kinds of things, and people not living downtown, um, look at where parking money is going. Um, you know, I don't know if you would necessarily want to speak to Mike Davis's uh, opinion, but it was an interesting <laughs> moment nonetheless. Yeah, that's wrong. Um. <laughs> Verified. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, you know, I mean, so quickly, what the reason why the the train doesn't go to uh, the airport is that at the time, I mean, this is one of the dangers of building sort of fixed route transit uh, with limited amounts of money. At the time they were making that decision, they they said, well, we have enough money to either go to the airport or go to where it ultimately goes, which is out toward Redondo Beach and so forth. And and honestly, the the people at Metro looked at it and they said, well, there's so many aerospace jobs out at the beach, and those are never going to go away. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the Cold War ended, and they all went away. And now we have a rail line that goes to a nice little beach community. Yeah. Um, and as for the strength of the parking industry, uh, I mean, no. <laughs> okay, uh, we can uh, we'll, get, we'll get Mike on this next year. Um, uh, David, I'd like to circle back to um, a couple things. Um, there was an in interesting, um, albeit uh, tragically. Uh, underwritten um, event recently that, that you've commented on, which was um, after the Boston Marathon bombing, the older brother, uh, Tamerlan Tsarnaev, uh, was refused burial uh, by cemeteries in the Boston area. Um, I guess I'm just curious if you could address that, the, I guess the symbolic power of refusing something's interment, which I think is quite interesting, as well as the power of a cemetery to say no to something that might want to be buried there, to a, a particularly uh, a Charles Manson-like figure, or, it's, or a Tamerlan Sarnia. Is, is, is this a good power for cemeteries to have, the power of refusal? 
good, I don't know if it's good or bad. Uh, it depends very much upon the circumstances. I think immediately of bin Laden, sure. how they wouldn't bring his body back so that it could be buried. And so burial places have great power, symbolically. Um, if we think of uh, just, you can think of lots of different examples of places that you've gone to visit someone who is a hero to you or a villain and, and went to their burial place to sort of kick the ground and spit on them or to honor and, and, and offer a, a homage. And so in some sense, cemeteries struggle with this back, for, back and forth. Um, so I grew up in a cemetery. My dad was the superintendent of a cemetery in uh, Syracuse, New York. And there was a serial killer in the Adirondacks when I was a teenager. And it turned out that his son actually worked for my dad. And he had a lot in the cemetery. And the son wanted to bury him in the cemetery. And so my dad said, yes, we'll do that. We're just not going to put a marker on it. We're just going to make it sort of you, your family will know where it is, the people that you want to know where it is, but we don't want to create a place that, that it will become either a place for people to loathe or people, uh, you, you'd be surprised. If there are people that go to serial killers' graves on a regular basis. They, instead of underground parking tours, there are, you know, <laughs> there's, there's a whole movement around the world. Uh, there's actually a new academic field of study in what's known as dark tourism. And dark tourism is both the Holocaust sites and, uh, and things like that, but it's also cemeteries. And so there's, there's this huge industry out there of uh, people taking ghost tours and all that stuff. And so that sort of fits in with that. I think most uh, uh, cemeteries struggle with this because remember that most cemeteries, whether they're a Catholic cemetery or a Protestant, Jewish, or a Muslim, they're community institutions. And so they are, they're trying to balance how do you how do you rep, how do you serve individual families and also represent an entire community? And so when you have something like the the tragedy of terrorism, uh, it is a it's a it's a powerful moment where the community wants this person to sort of disappear completely, utterly, and the cemetery has to decide how they're going to handle that kind of activity. Um, because th in the end, it's their responsibility if someone has a lot in their cemetery uh, to to um, serve the family as well as the community. So there is this balance that they would go through. Um, I've got uh, well, I've, I've, I've many, many questions, but I'll just do two more questions before throwing it open to the audience. So if you've got something that you want to know, uh, get, get ready. Uh, um, uh, but Dan, I wanted to circle back to you briefly. Um, we, we, when we spoke prior to the event, you mentioned... Uh, Basically, that you know, infrastructure in Los Angeles is not only for human beings. That that other creatures take advantage of the city we've built. You know, as Joe was was referencing in the previous uh, uh, panel, you know, ants and beetles and insects make make a, a very rich or find a very rich home here. Uh, I guess I'm just curious if you could talk about some of the other species who we've inadvertently built a, uh, a kind of an ecosystem for by creating both storm water networks and and sewers that that might be. Um, you know, infested or have other kinds of non-human species living in them. Yeah. So most of the time uh, when our crews are down in the drains, they don't see too many animals. Every once in a while, there's uh, some evidence that gets left behind. Um, and easy enough to walk around that. But uh, we, got, we got some complaints from a neighborhood that had raccoons that were using the storm drains as a little highway around the neighborhood. Um, <laughs> and uh, wreaking havoc on their vegetable gardens and going in and turning over their trash cans. And then um, there was a lot of pressure on my department to go and uh, fix the situation for them. And we, I was just confused because I, I didn't understand how, uh, how it was the responsibility if these guys were gonna go in a catch basin and go down into a pipe and then pop up somewhere else, that that would be any more our responsibility to fix that than it would be for the road department to not allow them to go on the street or, you know, whatever else. So it was a, uh, yeah. They shouldn't allow them on the street. No, they, yeah, out of control. No. But uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was kind of interesting. We have uh, also chased uh, um, stray dogs up channels and then they'll go up into storm drains. And uh, um, yeah, it's uh, our guys have a little bit of a tough time with that. 
the uh, most interesting thing that I had happen was uh, there was a high-speed chase, and the uh, suspect um, went down into a channel, ditched his car, and then ran up into a storm drain. And so it was pretty fun going out with the SWAT team <laughs> and uh, <laughs> popping manholes with them. And I was reading the plans and you know trying to guess where I thought the drain might be. And uh, our our crews were helping as well. Um, they eventually sent one of the SWAT team down on, we, we have these like giant skateboard like things that we use to uh, inspect the drains. And so the cop went down there with his gun and light out in front of him on, on this like skateboard deal looking for him. <laughs> but they never found the guy. So uh, I don't know, it was, uh, it was interesting. I think he went up a side drain and I asked the cop if, uh, did, did you look up the side drain? And he was like, would well, you think I'm stupid? And I was like, dude, but, but, <laughs> but I was like, but, you, you, you went from, you know, 200 feet up there over to here in like 10 seconds. I really don't think you looked in the side drains, but that's okay. Anyway, I think I offended him, but he had a gun, so I shut up. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Doesn't one have to ask, did you ever find a giant ant? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know which drain that one was in, but I, I, I heard it had a beetle hanging out with it. <laughs> um, yeah. They promised me they were there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I just want to end then with, uh, or in my section of the of the of the Q and A, with a question um, for all three of you. Um, it seems really interesting to look ahead into the future at lo what innovations might be changing the field that you work in, um, whether it's uh, the future of burial or future of uh, crematorial practices. Uh, what might happen to uh, you know in an area of self-driving cars or you know robotic underground parking lots that are more like hives, um, or for that matter, some kind of uh, you know addressing maybe the renaturalization of, of, of sewers and uh, excuse me of stormwater drains. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I'm curious, in, in any order, or maybe, maybe Mike, if you want to grab this one first, um, I'm curious if you could just address the future of the field as you see it and what might be uh, shaping it. Sure. I mean, I think that a lot of, I mean, I think that futurism in transportation has always involved, or for, has a, for a long time involved, some desire to escape the crowded surface, right? So uh, for a while it was like we're going to have monorails or we're going to have... Um, flying cars or things like that, and, and I think more recently, um, we we've seen you know there's been a lot of excitement in Los Angeles about building another subway and, and expanding our subway underground. Um, Elon Musk, uh, you probably all know, has uh, has proposed this idea of a network of tunnels where a car would get on a high speed platform and zip around. And I think that um, that he's got a very got a very interesting YouTube sort of sketch of that. Uh, which is evidence that if you're a billionaire, you can say anything and people will take you seriously. Uh, the, it's hard to know what's going to happen in the future, but I would say that like, it's also easy to overlook that um, whatever advances come, like there's just, we have created an environment that makes driving very easy, right? And so to the, to the extent we are trying to solve problems caused by driving, like something, you know, we have to have a reckoning with all the parking we build, especially the parking that's in place under our, under our buildings and under our city. And so the, it's, I think it's easy to get distracted, but well, the, you know, the robot cars are coming. Okay, maybe, I mean, the, if you look re at serious estimates of when they're coming, it's somewhere between like five and 50 years from now. Um, but honestly, I mean, I think that we have, what, what the future should hold is a desire to actually make people who drive cars and own cars pay the correct cost for doing that. That's going to be the big difference. And we don't need new technology to do that. We could do it tomorrow. Uh, sure, I'll talk about the future. Um, the estimates now are that 70% uh, of Americans will be cremated by 2035. And so the reason for the name of my book Dead is... Dead Americans or uh, all yeah. Americans? <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's be technical. I still, well, we'll say dead Americans. That all deaths, 70% of, of all deaths, will be disposed by the means of cremation. Uh, the question, so there's a huge, the reason my book's called Is the Cemetery Dead is as that happens, that's the market shrinking dramatically for cemeteries which bury and entomb and don't make near as much money on cremations. But there's also this really interesting thing that's happened is that environmentalists are now attacking 
uh, fire cremation as an environmental danger. And actually, the EPA's had some studies. They've done, they put, they put scrubbers on lots of the older cre crematories uh, because there's uh, mercury that comes out from the fillings in your teeth and other places that actually creates some environmental hazard. So there's a group of people. There's one in Scandinavia who wants to free freeze drive bodies. And then there's uh, another one who wants to use hydraulic stuff. I can't think of it. Uh, there's another word, sorry. And they want to essentially liquefy you. And so there's the water cremation and there's the, I, they don't call it freeze drive cremation, but I do. <laughs> and uh, they are actually both now, uh, the, the water cremation, the aqua cremation, is actually now being used at UCLA for cadaver animals. Um, as a way to, because it's, it's far more efficient in the use of its energy um, than uh, fire cremation. So there's that part that's really coming fast, I think, and w there's going to be opportunities for changes in the way that we do that kind of thing. And, of course, then there's the wackier kind of things. You can now get your cremation shot into space if you want to spend that money. You can also get your cremation, cremated remains turned into jewelry, which you can uh, wear around. Uh, very popular, actually. Uh, it's been around for a while now, but they've really gotten it down to be much more efficient. Uh, there are now people actually using cremated remains in uh, tattoos, uh, in memorial tattoos. They actually used it, it put the cremains in with the, the ink um, as a way to remember the, the loved one. And so there's a, it is a moment, actually. So my book is really about the crisis that the cemetery is facing, and it's about this extraordinary opportunity when uh, many, someone in the room found out in the last year that someone died on Facebook. And so there's this enormous now digital footprint for mourning and memorialization on the Internet that really doesn't change the underground and part of it, you know, the body has to, something's got to happen to the body. But it really is changing the symbolic landscape. So the future of storm drains. Um, <laughs> the storm drains were, uh, were installed um, because it doesn't rain that much here. They were probably in other parts of the country, might have been natural creeks. And in arid Southern California, um, yeah, the, that little canyon or that little ditch didn't get enough water in it, and it was more profitable. And the thinking at the time was that you know contain the the, the stormwater flows and then build over the top. Um, the future I see is as much as possible disconnecting and decentralizing kind of the uh, the drainage infrastructure, um, disconnecting rooftops and paved areas, and allowing that water to infiltrate into the ground, and that will you know, support our local water supply in a much, much better way. As um, new communities are developed, that's a lot easier to accomplish. Um, I don't see us really undoing all of the, the, the storm drains under the existing portions of, of the county. I do see a lot of uh, opportunity to improve um, our above ground drainage systems, and we see a lot of that on the, on the LA River and, and other um, other channelized portions of the drainage infrastructure that I'm, I'm hopeful can really have a, uh, a significant, um, be a significant agent of change, um, yeah, for the, for the broader county. All right, well, great, thanks. Um, I think that that sets the stage for some really uh, intriguing ongoing conversations. And uh, let's take some questions from, uh, let's do the, the back first there, with the, the hand. You know, I, I thought the discussion about parking was particularly about about 20 years ago, when the first year, when the first school of public policy was being created at, at UCLA, I taught some courses, and one of them I taught in 1999 was a seminar for students to study the downtown revitalization, which was just beginning at that time, and that I was already quite a bit involved in. And a couple of things that came out from uh, studies of parking was that number one, there actually was enough parking in downtown; you didn't really need more. <laughs> it was just a question that people didn't know where it was or how to find it. And, and I think that may, in fact, still be the case, to your point. The second point now, we spend a lot of time talking about the homelessness problem. 
And that's d directly connected to these parking requirements because the parking requirements drive up the cost of all the housing for everybody and certainly make it harder for development developers who would even want to and be willing, more than willing, to, to do more affordable housing, which then would more housing for that and then ultimately uh, for the homeless issue. So it's a really critical policy question that relates to so many other things that go beyond parking. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, and, and I have like a, a, a I, just to add add to that. I mean, I think you're a thousand percent correct. I mean, my two main reactions are that it's very hard to uh, to say like, but but planners always want to do this to figure out if an area has enough parking, um, and it, it's not something we do with too many other things, right? I mean, nobody looks at the neighborhood and says like, well, th does it have enough restaurants? Does it have enough? <laughs> Chinese restaurants. I mean, we sort of figure if people want them, they'll start. Um, but because we've sort of arrogated parking entirely to sort of government mandates, the government feels like it has to do something that's essentially impossible, which is decide the quantity ahead of time, the parking that people will need, and then try and force someone else to build it. And so, of course, you run out of it. Uh, and to your point about affordability, it, that's very true. It is, as long as you have a parking requirement, it is uh, impossible to build very inexpensive housing, like single room occupancy hotels or things like that. The, the parking itself is just more expensive than the unit. Um, and, and San Diego is a great example of this. From back in the 90s, um, they deregulated the, the, they took parking requirements away from single room occupancy hotels and private housing for the homeless um, blossomed. Uh, they actually built quite a bit of it. Uh, and then the neighbors realized that private housing for the homeless was blossoming and they put the parking requirement back on it uh, and it stopped. Was there, um, here? I have a question about the cost of dying and burying and maybe um, a conversation about race and class and how that plays into where people bury their dead. Um, I'm from Washington State, people you, um, unsettled, undocumented immigrants will uh, tend to send their dead back to Mexico. Uh, in the community that I look at, so maybe just a little bit about racism. Sure. There's like four questions there. I'll, I may forget, so just, well, it's really a couple more. So let's deal with the last one first. Immigrants have always sent their dead back home. Uh, there's actually a book that tried to calculate uh, what happened between 1880 and 1920 in America with, because it was a huge period of immigration by new populations. And they found that uh, the Chinese sent back almost as many dead people back to China as actually arrived in the United States. Okay. And, uh, and so it depends upon how, they, uh, how the immigrant community is connected to the spaces of the, the community. And so uh, undocumented immigrants are often uh, ostracized or marginalized within communities. Uh, the Catholic Church is probably better than most institutions in trying to deal with that, uh, but I'm sure that many of them send them back to uh, where their families were and are. Cemeteries are, are one of those sticky items where you, know, you move to Los Angeles and yet when you die, you, you get sent back to, to Boston or to Chicago or wherever. And so it's often tied to a long-term family and that's as true with immigrants as it is with uh, Native Americans or anywhere else in the world. I mean, Puerto Rico uh, was a class. There's been actually been a pretty good study of Puerto Rican uh, repatriation of bodies back to Puerto Rico over decades of time from New York City. Uh, so the cost of uh, cost the costs are very really a lot. I mean, you can buy a mausoleum crypt in Los Angeles, Southern California right now, that's about eighty to a hundred thousand dollars. Right? Uh, Gregory Peck is underneath the cathedral downtown on, on Grand Avenue. Um, and and that I think those costs somewhere when he bought it, and this is some time ago, I think they were going for fifty thousand dollars a piece. And so it can it's it's not as bad as in East Asia. Right in in Tokyo and Japan, uh, the cost of a burial can be a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars. I mean, it's unbelievable. But most Americans pay roughly a median of somewhere around six to ten thousand dollars. 
for a full burial, uh, funeral and burial in a cemetery. Southern California is a pretty expensive space for that uh, compared to other places because there aren't, one of the things that happens in starting in the 1950s is that most suburbs don't build cemeteries. And so if you go to Irvine and upper northern uh, Orange County, there's, they're still using cemeteries from Santa Ana that are dec you know, literally decades old. And so there haven't been a lot of new cemeteries. The one last thing is uh, the difference between cost between burial and cremation is also very variable. You can spend a lot of money on a cremation. I mean, because if you get one of those gorgeous urns that cost $5,000, then you can have a niche that costs $12,000. I mean, you can spend a lot of money, but you can also do it very inexpensively. And so one of the things that's happened, uh, and it's actually happening in LA, uh, Hillside in uh, Inglewood has a new section where they're trying to return to simpler burial uh, techniques. They're called natural burial grounds. They came out of, of England. And there you go back to the shroud. There is no outer casket, or the outer casket is made of a very simple natural wood, bamboo, pine, and you're buried in the ground without it, no embalming, no, none of the other stuff. And then you're, actually the family often takes care of them. The trick is that in some of that cases, that's very reasonably cost, and in others, that's actually very expensive as well. So the cost of burial, is a big deal in, in society. It's very difficult for lower income people because lower income people are usually committed to burial or to entombment. They're not gonna, they're, so Orthodox communities are much less likely to cremate than non-Orthodox communities, whether they be evangelical or Orthodox Jewish. And so the cost burden on poor people is actually quite high. Um, let's go in the, the extreme back there. You, uh, you're the gentleman. Yeah, you on the on the right, my right. So, um, this follows up on something that Dan just mentioned a second ago. And, uh, um, so when I was a kid, I used to skateboard in Storm Drains in this area. And I wonder if one could argue that the sport of skate, uh, skateboarding actually emerged here in Southern California, not just because of surfing and empty backyard swimming pools, but also the presence of Storm Drains. So the follow-up question then is: Is the Storm Drain network uh, unique for LA compared to other cities uh, because the geography is the San Gabriel Mountains and this big floodplain and suburbanization creates this you know extended watershed <coughs> and, and as you mentioned it's an arid environment but whether you could compare LA to other cities in the requirements for flood control. Yeah the wow I don't know about the link to skateboarding but um, but the uh, the differences between there, there, a lot of older cities used what's called a combined sewer system. So they had their regular sewer from the toilet, and then they would take the rainwater and funnel it into that, into that system as well when it rained. Um, that results in what's called a com combined sewer overflow. Basically, when it rains, you end up, um, the treatment plant gets overwhelmed, and you end up with raw sewage in the, in the receiving water courses which um, that's a good thing we didn't go that route here. <laughs> so um, in most, most cities are, are, are going with a, uh, going with completely, or all new systems are completely separated. Um, well, except for low flows, <laughs> which that kind of urban drool, we're often taking that, um, that low flow, that little, little amount of extra runoff that comes from cities, and we're actually taking that and putting it into the sewer. Um, but that's a, yeah, that's not stormwater. Um, with regard to how this area is different, the hydrology of Southern California is extremely flashy. There is um, the way the, the storms come in, um, we have very long dry periods and the amount of rain that can fall in a short amount of time is extremely high compared to um, other parts of the country where you kind of get a little bit more routine storms. Um, up in the Bay Area, you, you'll see natural creeks because you know they flow pretty often. Um, if that same, that same drainage area was in Southern California, it would be dry almost all the time. Um, so I think that's what, that, that's what represents um, one of the biggest changes, uh, the biggest difference is how, how often it's dry and the quantity of water that can come so quickly. And Bill has some. Sure. Um, Bill, Deborah. David, I have a question about the, something intermediate between cremation and 
conventional cemetery burial, and that's the mausolea. I had heard, and you would know, that the mausolea cre uh, craze, or whatever it would be from the mid-19th century for the wealthy to build above-ground crypts and all, was res a response to body theft uh, of the rich. Is that true? Uh, I, I, oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, uh, so mausoleas go way back, right? Back to Mr. Mausolee, uh, <laughs> Mausolus. Uh, but, uh, and they have had a l illustrious history for literally millennia. So I, I, think, it's, I think it's unfair to tie it to a, you know, the craze the, the, the body theft craze. Um, so I think most of it happens because the rich were trying to prove they were rich. Mm -hmm. But it is true that there is this period in Western history, and America is no different, where uh, anatomical investigation was essentially illegal and that modern medicine needed bodies. And so there was a whole industry of people going and getting bodies out of cemeteries. And, uh, and so dissection proved essential to the development of modern medicine. And uh, the only way you can, you have to have more and more material. Uh, one of the reasons they, you get the little thing in your license, they need uh, more and more material. But there's another thing that happened in the 19th century that probably pushed this as well. And that was, when are you dead? Uh, it sounds like a simple question, but even today we have uh, extraordinary ethical debates about when people are dead. And is it a brain dead? Is it a heart death? It, you know, how do we decide? And as modern medicine emerges in the 19th century, they are struggling with this very real concept that sometimes they think they're burying people who are not actually dead. Premature burial is an enormous concern in the 19th century. And being buried in the ground makes it really bad because it's, you know, there's classic, there is actually, there is actually a, a, an example of a man who was so worried about this, he had a little string uh, connected to his finger, and then at the top of his grave, there was a bell. <laughs> so if you hear the bell, come get me. <laughs> and, and, and mausoleum crypts are not as sealed as cemetery graves. They're not as suffocating. And so uh, it is possible that that was another drive that, that they wanted to make sure. There's a very famous example, really long time ago, Henry Lawrence, who's one of the people who signed the Declaration of Independence was one of the very, very few pe notable people in the United States who was buried on, uh, cremated on open pyre when he died in the early 19th century. And the reason that he did that was that he was about to bury his granddaughter. His little granddaughter was like three, I think, and she started to cry. And she wasn't dead. She was in, she was in some sickness and came out of a fever or whatever it was and suddenly was alive. And he said, I'm not, that's not happening to me. <laughs> and so he was cremated. Uh, let's go to the front here. Questions about sinkholes for those who, who didn't hear it, map, mapping them and, and explaining them? So there's not, to my understanding, a comprehensive map. Um, sinkholes, uh, typically in the Southern California area, those will happen when an underground drainage system gets some kind of a hole in it. And then water from the surface is able to infiltrate down. And as it finds that hole, it'll bring material with it. And eventually, that can result in you know a big, you know, somewhat cavernous space. Um, you know, usually they're not giant enough for a, uh, you know, maybe a bus wheel could fall into it. But uh, um, under, it it's often happens under roadways, and then eventually you get a little depression in the, uh, in the asphalt, and somebody goes and looks, and we get to go fix it. But, um, yeah, so the, the big sinkholes that, I mean, you hear about with, uh, in areas that have a lot of limestone, um, down in the south, 
those are um, an extremely, that's a different, different kind of process that creates those. That, Um, that my guess on some of that is it's due to lack of compaction of the subgrade. So, you know, um, sometimes when you when you are going to build something, you're, you're supposed to compact the material pretty well, including after you build a storm drain pipe, you're supposed to go back and compact the soil as you uh, layer it back up and then put the roadway surface back on. Sometimes contractors don't do such a good job at that, and that <laughs> results in uh, settling. But that's a little different than a sinkhole. Um, there in the middle, in the third row. I just wanted to add uh, Native American cemeteries, the list of cemeteries that are throughout Southern California. They're usually contested for real estate purposes and so forth, but they're all throughout Southern California. And then I wanted to ask a question about what happens to the stormwater. I had this idea that, of course, we have to worry about recharging the aquifers. And running them all off into the ocean doesn't do a good job of that. So I know the, the bed of the LA River has some areas that are, uh, as you know, like chopped up so the water can sink down. Sure. But wouldn't it be interesting to do that in the storm canal, in the storm drains, go in there and chop it up? And but, but I occurred to me, oh, not a good idea because that water is poisonous and filthy as we see at the beach at the end of the rain. So what's happening with cleaning the, the aquifer vis-a-vis -vis storm drains and the cleaning of the water from the storm drains? There's a, there's a lot there. That's a good question. Um, so directly recharging um, groundwater from within the storm drain is problematic. As um, the water goes down into the ground, it's going to bring some fine material with it. And that's why we do that offline in large ponds that you'll, you'll see around the county, Montebello area, Pico Rivera, um, up by Irwindale, up in Tahanga. Those are areas where it's geologically conducive to getting water from the surface down through the alluvium and into the aquifer. Um, a lot of the areas that are on the, you know, adjacent to the lower LA River, there's um, confining clay layers in the, uh, in the soil that prevent water from the surface. It'll go down into the ground, but the water gets confined into an upper aquifer and it doesn't get down into the water, into the aquifer that's used for drinking water. Um, so that is the, one of the main roles of, of the flood control district is that um, we do try, we put in a lot of, uh, a lot of water back into the ground. Um, the places that we're doing it are the, the best and most conducive to that. We're looking to increase that over the, over the next several years. We're also looking at decentralizing that and allowing that to happen in um, smaller quantities in, uh, in different areas. So that is part of our strategy for water resilience for Southern California. And right now, we get about a third of our water supply from local sources like that. And what about cleaning the water? Oh, yeah. And as far as cleaning it, the best way to clean it is to do what's called source control. So to not let the water get polluted in the first place. Um, so there's efforts at, at, uh, at making sure the streets are kept clean. Um, routine street sweeping actually does a, does a good job at picking up a lot of the material that gets in the, wa in the water. Um, alternatively, uh, running it through biofiltration before it goes into, into the storm drain is another, another alternative that helps. So um, it's a combination of, of all of that working together. And from, you know, just uh, as to you mentioned toxic and how bad it is, but the water in the LA River, even during storms, is often cleaner than most of the world drinks. And it's not that not that, that makes it OK, but the, the, the scale of the problem um, it's, it's important, but it may not be quite to the scale of toxic, like you mentioned, or how, how, how horrid you might think it is. But take a walk on the beach. Like no, I, I, I hear you. I hear you. There's, there's, there's improvements. There's, there's trash. Um, there's bacteria that gets in there. Um, yeah, there's lots, lots to be done. Um, let's take one more question on this side. Um, Nikki, do you want to grab it? with all the parking itself and I'm just curious do we know how much subterranean parking we have and are there plans for its reuse like uh, what could that be useful for if anything well uh, no no one knows um, uh, <laughs> in part because we built it in such a piecemeal way that 
that you, you know, this is a, a process that uh, is so disaggregated that when someone goes to build something, we make them build some parking, and then, you know, so, and conceivably, uh, if you pulled out every building permit application that's been that's been done in the last 20 years, you could add up all the parking spaces and figure it out. But the way the planning department looks at it is that once one building has its parking done, they just they never have to look at it again. And the next building that comes up, even if it's next door, has to build its required parking. It doesn't matter if there's parking next to it. So the, the main way you could repurpose it is to stop having these requirements and then it would get shared. Right, and so one of the things that happened in the historic district of downtown LA wasn't that these people went in and, and constructed housing and just said, well, no one wants to, to own cars. Um, what they said is that, well, I bet some people are willing to own a car and are willing to walk half a block to get to it. And so like the LA Times, which used to be, of course, much larger, has like a largely empty parking structure. And so a lot of those buildings just lease spaces from it, or they lease spaces from other commercial uses that aren't as heavily used during the night when their tenants are going to be home. And so you, you could just move towards shared parking um, and, and give that the parking right now, which there's so much excess, a, a sort of economic life. But we can't do that if we just constantly increase the supply of it. Um, so that's how you would, you would come to grips with it. You, you would just stop mandating a steady new supply and then you would find that it would probably get shared. Can I just add one thing? I, in some places in Europe, they're actually beginning to think about how to redesign the construction of parking garages in some way so that they could be adapted if there's not going to be cars for the future. And I think that's one of the other things that could be done in places like L.A., but we're very conventional in the way we think about parking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess it's, um, I, I was talking mostly about the underground parking, but with structures, if you're going to build a new structure, I think it's very wise now to design it in a way that it could be converted. And that just basically involves like you can't have um, ramped floors, right? When the, when the floor slopes, you can't turn it in and you would, you would build it so that it holds a bigger load and things like that. Um, so there is a way to design it so that down the road you could repurpose it. All right, well, this has been fascinating. Um, we do have a, if there's other questions, I don't mean to volunteer my panelists, but uh, you can maybe corner them over a cup of coffee and, and uh, continue the conversation. Um, but uh, let's give a round of applause for uh, the panel. Okay, uh, my thanks to the panel and to Jeff as well. That was terrific. Um, lunch is down the hall. Um, you'll see as you go in, it's a sandwich bar. Uh, there's two sides to the table, so uh, we might want to move as incrementally as possible through it because there's a lot of us. At the far end of the room, in there, a beautiful one of our showpiece rooms, and you're welcome to move around the space here with your lunches. At the far end of the room, you'll see some of uh, the sandwich uh, makings, etc., that are off limits for now. We're expecting uh, um, about 30 high school kids to join us, and we've promised to feed them. So if at the far end of the room, don't touch those sandwich makings <laughs> until the high school kids get to go through them. But at the short end of the room, as you walk in, help yourselves. Uh, please help us clean up the room. Um, during lunch, we'll be screening a Lost LA uh, movie on uh, tunnels beneath LA. So that'll show up on the screens here or in that room there. You're welcome to take your food and uh, sit in there as well, or the room where the lunch is served. We'll reconvene here. Um, the next panel begins at 1.45 with the militarized underground. Um, but if you'll be in your seats right around 1.30, then we're sure to keep to time. So thank you for a great morning. Yeah. Jeff, that was great. Just right. Just right.